Well, congratulations. You have just won our magazine's annual $250,000 sweepstakes. Please call this number to verify your address and tell us when is the best time for our courier to hand deliver this certified check. Well, if that's true, you're a quarter million dollars richer. Chances are you'd at least investigate the validity of the claim. It's just too promising to ignore. The Bible claims to be a letter from God offering you invaluable benefits. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15-17 through 17 reads, The Holy Scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible claims repeatedly to be a message from God offering you eternal life in heaven when you die and an abundant life on earth while you're alive. So every one of us should be keenly interested in whether or not this book is true. It's just too promising to ignore. It certainly merits our careful investigation. Now before we move on, I'm going to share with you some new statistics regarding the Bible. The Barna Research Group, in conjunction with the American Bible Society, just issued a report, Hala for Press, The State of the Bible 2021. And they report that Bible users in the United States increased so far the first six months of 2021. The proportion of Bible users in the United States has remained fairly constant for the past decade. In typical years, approximately half of American adults reach for the Bible, at least occasionally. Back in 2014, Barna's team estimated that an all-time high of 53% of American adults were Bible users, and the low point was 48% in 2019. Well, they also report that Americans largely believe that the nation would fare poorly without the Bible. Over half of U.S. adults at 54% believe that America would be worse off without the Bible, which is actually a 5% increase from 2020. Their report also states that over half of U.S. adults say the Bible is without error. Interesting, most descriptions of what the Bible actually is still far fall within the realm of Christian orthodoxy. About one quarter of respondents at 26% believe the Bible is the actual word of God and should be taken literally. The report also says that half of Americans affirm the Bible contains the keys to living a meaningful life. The slight majority of Americans agree that Scripture's message is particularly helpful at 54% saying the Bible contains everything a person needs to live a life that's meaningful. And then one in six U.S. adults reads the Bible most days during the week. Data revealed that over 181 million Americans opened the Bible the past six months. That uh, number is up significantly, 7.1% from 2020, when 169 million adults used the Bible at least occasionally. And in 2021 so far, we estimate that 128 American the adults reach for the Bible with regularity, Barna concludes. And near the end of the report, it reads, It's clear that the hearts are being softened to the Bible, but will this willingness to open Scripture, even if infrequently, evolve into a deeper engagement with the message? Or will middling Bible usage satisfy a need for just enough? Well, I'm going to share with you this morning reasons that I believe the Bible is true from beginning to end and how you can reinforce your confidence in the truth of the Bible. Because there are many yet in our culture who don't believe it's true or can be trusted with your soul for eternity. And they don't believe it can be our guide for living the best, most complete, most fulfilling life here now. Listen, as we start this series, Engage, Living Out the Great Commission, we have to start here. Because if this book, the Bible, isn't true, then what are we doing? But if it is indeed true, then what are we going to do? We're going to address this issue through the upcoming fall months. Um, so I hope that you'll stick with us. I love the Bible. 
allow me to give you a very brief testimony about my journey with Scripture. I became a Christian, Christian when I was 12 years of age and, and read the Bible some periodically um, through my first several years of being a Christian till I was first semester sophomore student at Ozark Bible College in Joplin, Missouri when I was taking a survey of the educational mission of the church by Milfo Staten. And he challenged us students to read um, for personal understanding, not just for classes, not just to pass a test in different courses, but to read to know God. And he gave us some options for a Bible reading plan. And so I began at that point, at age 19, a plan that I still continue this day of reading one psalm a day, one proverb a day. There's 150 psalms, so you'll read through the psalms two and a half times a year if you read a psalm a day. There's 31 proverbs, so you'll read through the proverbs 12, uh, 12 times a year if you read one a day. The months that don't have 31 days, you just have to read an extra proverb or two at the end of the month to complete all 31. And you can read through the New Testament once a month, 12 times a year, year after year, and I have by reading, taking the total number of pages in your favorite Bible for the New Testament, dividing that by the number of days in the month, and you'll have how many pages you need to cover every day. And you can do all this in about 45 minutes. That's not that much of an investment of your time. I'm not a, an extremely fast reader, um, and I don't memorize exceedingly well, but it's amazing how much you will soak up by just going through the scripture over and over again. And you'll see things 10 years from now you didn't see this year. That's the treasure of scripture. It is indeed like a treasure that you have to mine out. And the more you understand and obey what you understand, the more is revealed to you. The Bible is a special book. Now, I completely believe it's the revealed word of God. A word that's often used to describe the Bible among conservative scholars is the word inerrancy, which means the scriptures in the original manuscripts are completely true in everything they affirm. But here are some common sense reasons why we can conclude the Bible is without error and worthy of our absolute, complete trust. The first is the Bible is a reasonable con conclusion. You can believe in the reliability of the Bible because of its reasonable conclusion. It is reasonable to assume that the Creator of the universe would desire to communicate with His creation. The closest we come to creating anything is when we have children. And when that new baby arrives, you instinctively want to communicate and get close to that child. It would be unnatural for God to create a being with the capacity to think and feel and not to try to communicate with them. The message of the Bible is that God wants to have an intimate relationship with us, a personal relationship with every one of us, his highest creation, so much so that he came to earth and visited here in the flesh for, for 33 years. And if God is capable of creation and incarnation, he's certainly capable of writing the book. In fact, a verbal communication from God is essential for understanding the mind of God. Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9 reads, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Obviously, the one who created this universe is much more powerful and brilliant than we are. Who can know the mind of the Lord? How can we ever understand what God is thinking? We can't even understand what other human beings are thinking unless we somehow express it in words. We can't possibly know what God thinks just by our own willpower. Creation gives us some general ideas about God's power and His majesty and His wisdom and His love for variety. But we still need verbal communication to understand God's specific will for us. Some try to guess about God from their own intuition. But if God is a God of omnipotence and compassion, it's reasonable to believe that he would communicate his will to us in written form. In John 20, verse 31, it says, But these things are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that you may that by believing you may have life in his name. So we can know the Bible is trustworthy because of its reasonable conclusion.
But secondly, we can also believe in the reliability of the Bible because of its unique composition. The construction of the Bible is unlike any other book. <clears throat> it's really not one book, of course, but a library is 66 books written by about 40 different authors from divergent backgrounds over a period of 1,500 years on three different continents. Now, can you imagine a medical journal carrying the advice of 40 different doctors dating back over a 1,500-year period from, from 2021 to, to year 500? It would be full of, of contradictions. The, the reason the Bible is consistent is that it's one ultimate author behind it, God himself. In 2 Peter 1.21, Peter writes, For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke, as they, as, for, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Just as a sailboat is carried along by the wind, then the writing of the scripture was God breathe. God didn't etch it in stone the way that he did the Ten Commandments for Moses. He didn't dictate it in the way that Muslims say Allah did for Muhammad. But God did not put the writers into a trance to take total control of their hand. Every writer used their own memory, their own style and background, but God guided the results. And Jesus said, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you, his apostles, into all truth. Now, some say, do you think the writers of the New Testament knew when they were writing that they were writing the Word of God? And I believe they did. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, We also thank God continually because when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the Word of men, but as it actually is, the Word of God, which is at work in you who believe. Paul knew that he was, when he was writing and speaking as an apostle, he was communicating God's will, God's word. I believe that God guided the writing of the New Testament, and he went to great lengths to preserve the books he intended to be included for the past 2,000 years. Its unique composi composition is evidence of the Bible's divine authorship. But thirdly, I believe in the reliability of the Bible because of its impressive durability. Because of its impressive durability. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So here's a book that survived for 2,000 years. It's not just survived, however, it's thrived. The Bible is by far the most popular book in the world. According to the top 10 of everything, the 2016 edition by Paul Terry, the Bible is listed as first with more than 6 billion copies distributed. The second most widely distributed book is a book of quotations from Mao Zedong of 900 million. But the Bible is unsurpassed in status. It's not even close. And if you've never read the Bible, you're not educated in the most popular book of all time. The Bible, of course, was originally written on material that perishes, papyrus, and yet the words have survived. It was written long ago before the printing press and copy machines and had to be copied meticulously by hand, and yet it has survived. The Bible has been analyzed and scoffed at and attacked more than any other book, yet it has survived every attack for nearly 2,000 years. In the beginning, the church... Uh, of the church, the Romans attempted to confiscate and burn every copy of the scriptures, yet the Bible endured. Voltaire, the French skeptic, predicted Christianity would be an extinct religion within a hundred years of his death, and the only place you'd find a Bible would be in a museum. And Voltaire died in 1778. He became extinct. And the circulation of the Bible continues to increase around the world. And just to prove that God has a sense of humor, ironically, within 50 years of Voltaire's death, the Geneva Bible Society bought his home and used his printing presses to print Bibles. Yeah, that's happened. 
Isaiah 40, verse 8 predicted, The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I want you to think of some of the attacks against the Bible in recent years. One relatively recent attack on the Bible was the best-selling book called The Da Vinci Code. I know you don't hear much about it today. But it was at the top of the best-seller list for 55 weeks and sold over 7 million copies. The Da Vinci Code is like a chocolate milkshake that contains just a gram of arsenic. It's appealing, but deadly. Dan Brown is no doubt a skillful writer, but he attempts to poison belief in the Bible. On two, page 230, it reads, The Bible is a product of man, my dear, not of God. On page 249, the Da Vinci Code presents Mary Magdalene as the wife of Jesus and the mother of Jesus' child. Brown calls Jesus' relationship with Mary Magdalene the greatest cover-up in human history. On page 341, we read, Every faith in the world is based on fabrication, he writes. Faith is the acceptance of what we imagine to be true that we cannot prove. Every religion describes God through metaphors, allegories, and exaggerations. The, problems, the problem arises when we begin to literally believe in our own metaphors. Well, on Friday, April 23, 2003, the Wall Street Journal carried an editorial debunking the book, The Da Vinci Code, and the editorial stated, and I quote, If it sounds like hogwash, that's because it is. And the Wall Street Journal editor recommended as a counter-argument Breaking the Da Vinci Code, a book by Daryl Bach, professor of New Testament studies at Dallas Theological Seminary at the time. But the Wall Street Journal editorial then added that the faithful believers, Christians, should not worry. The Bible has survived Galileo and Darwin, and it will survive Dan Brown. And it is. The Bible is impressive in its durability. But fourthly, you can also trust the reliability of the Bible because of its challenging complexity. You can trust it because of its challenging complexity. The main message of the Bible is so simple that a child can understand it. But there are parts of the Bible that are so deep that scholars are still contemplating the meaning. There are college and professional sports teams that have Bible studies where um, very skilled, talented athletes study the scripture together. Christians who have been believers for years get together and study the Bible line by line, precept by precept. Only God's word would be worthy of that kind of an analysis and study because it is milk and meat for the soul. And those who hunger for God keep hungering for his word. It is challenging in its complexity. But you can also believe the reliability of the Bible because of its amazing accuracy. You can trust it because of its amazing accuracy. And we'll spend a little bit more time here with this area. Uh, Josh McDowell points out that historical, the historical accuracy of the Bible can be proven by subjecting it to three generally accepted tests for determining historical reliability of any ancient document. Biblical or non-biblical. And the first is the bibliographical test. The bibliographical test is the test of the accuracy of the ancient manuscripts upon which the scripture was written. Now we don't have any original manuscripts of the New Testament. The autographs written by the apostles and close associates of the apostles like Luke, Luke for example. Those have not been found, and that's why the earliest manuscripts, along with the multiplicity of manuscripts, are important. The manuscript evidence for the accuracy of the New Testament is incredibly impressive. James MacDonald and God Wrote a Book points out that there are now more than 5,600 ancient manuscripts of the Greek New Testament, and add to that the 10,000 Latin manuscripts and the 9,300 other early versions and you end up with about 25,000 early manuscripts of the Bible. No other document even comes remotely close. The next most commonly copied document is Homer's Iliad with 643 manuscripts, and all of them are partial. Thus, the Bible manuscripts outnumber those of 
Homer's Iliad by nearly 40 to 1. But you can challenge most English professors who study ancient literature and say, well, I'm not sure we have a reliable version of Homer's Iliad. And he would say, well, I think we do because we have 643 manuscripts. That's sufficient. Well, with 25,000, who could seriously doubt that we have the original text of the Bible? It's amazing the way that God's preserved his word. Although the time, also I want you to consider the time gap between the original writing and the earliest copies. Although Homer's Iliad was written at 800 B.C., the earliest copy that we have is about 400 B.C., a difference of about 400 years. The New Testament was all completed, we believe, by A.D. 95. The earliest manuscript is a fragment from the Gospel of John, as far as I know, and it dates around to 125 A.D., or a span of only about 30 years after the completion of the New Testament, and it's probably a copy of the original. Lee Strobel in his book The Case for Christ points out that the earliest biographies of Alexander the Great were written more than 400 years after his death in 323 BC, yet historians consider them to be generally trustworthy. The Gospels were written within 30 to 60 years max after the life of Jesus, and that assures their accuracy. This November, it will be 58 years since President Kennedy was killed. But the people who write about his life now write more accurately and more objectively than people did immediately after his death because they've had time for emotions to settle down and to accumulate the most accurate information. About 30 years after Jesus died, Luke began his gospel with these words, Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theopolis, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. That's in Luke 1, verses 3 and 4. The Bible certainly passes the bibliographical test with flying colors. The second test for accuracy is the internal test. The internal test is the question, is there anything in the writing itself that would cause us to suspect its trustworthiness? Well, one of the impressive things about the content of the Bible is its, its raw honesty. The heroes in Greek mythology are exaggerated in power and goodness to the point it's obviously imagined. But the main characters of the Bible are presented with all of their human frailties. Noah got drunk. Abraham lied. David committed adultery. Peter denied Jesus, and we could go on and on and on. There's an authenticity about the Bible that comes through when it's read. If you were making up something, you wouldn't state things like that. You would gloss over people's mistakes and their sins. But the third test of accuracy is the external test, which is the corroboration from reliable sources outside the New Testament. I don't have time to document the archaeological discoveries that have confirmed the Bible. There's been dozens and dozens. But there's been the discovery of the name of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, uh, when historians claim no such king existed. Archaeologists also have discovered King David's name in stone. They've discovered the walls of the ruins of the walls of Jericho that for some reason had fallen outward, as the Bible said they did. They've discovered the ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah, verifying that they were indeed destroyed suddenly by molten ash. But let me tell you a little bit more about a recently, uh, relatively recent discovery. In May of 2005, Robert Cornuke published a book titled The Lost Shipwreck of Paul that's fascinating. You might remember in Acts 27, the Bible says that an Alexandrian ship on which Paul was sailing was caught in a ferocious storm and ran aground off the coast of the island of Malta. To lighten the ship, they cast the cargo overboard, including the ship's four anchors. Cornuk and his companions went searching for those four anchors over 1,900 years after the fact, after the event in Acts 27. 
They studied Luke's description and calculated he was describing what is now St. Thomas Bay in Malta. And just off the coast in about 30 feet of water, as Luke had described, they discovered four ancient Roman anchors. And Professor Anthony Bonanno of the University of Malta verified the anchors could indeed have existed in the time period of 100 BC to 100 AD, and they were used by Roman grain ships of that era. And finding four anchors in such close proximity indicated a sudden cut in the lines caused by some kind of crisis at the time. Sir William Ramsey, who was formerly a critic of the New Testament and a skeptic, did a detailed archaeological investigation of the writing of Luke. For example, in the book of Acts, Luke names 32 different countries, 54 cities, nine islands, and hundreds and hundreds of details without one single error. After his painstaking research, William Ramsey stated Luke's history is unsurpassed in respect of its trustworthiness. Peter Strohlmacher of Tübingen, Tübingen University, has a, who is an admitted skeptic, says, As a Western scripture scholar, I am inclined to doubt these gospel stories, but as a historian, I'm obligated to take them as reliable. The Bible, the biblical test as they stand, are the best hypothesis we have until now to explain what really happened. So that's a skeptic's way of admitting I want to find errors, but I can't, so maybe it's true after all. See, the Bible's manuscripts are amazingly accurate. And then number six, you can believe the Bible's reliability because of its fulfilled prophecy. Because of its fulfilled prophecy. No human being can predict the future. We still, with all of our technology and uh, knowledge accumulated today, we still have a difficult time having an accurate 10-day forecast. Um, sport, the games of different sports, the outcomes of different games and the point spreads uh, are wrong frequently. You see, only God can see the future and predict it accurately. Isaiah 46, verses 9 to 11 reads, I am God, there is none other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what's still to come. What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. And the Old Testament contained all kinds of predictions, dozens and dozens, that about the coming of the Messiah, and they were all fulfilled perfectly in Jesus Christ. Dozens and dozens. Let me give you just a few. For example, he'd be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14. He'd be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2. He'd be called Emmanuel, Isaiah 7, 14. He'd have a ministry in Galilee, Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. He'd ride into Jerusalem in, in triumph, Zechariah 9, 9. He'd be be betrayed by a friend to Psalm 41 9. That betrayal would be for 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah 11 13. He'd be falsely accused, Psalm 35 11. He'd be silent before his accusers, Isaiah 53 7. He'd have his hands and feet pierced, Psalm 22 16. He'd be crucified with thieves, Isaiah 53 12. His garments would be the object of casting lots, Psalm 22 18. And yet not any of his bones would be broken, Psalm 34, 20. He'd be buried in the tomb of the rich, Isaiah 53, 9. And he'd come back from the grave, Psalm 16, verse 10. Now, with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, it can now be proven those Old Testament predictions predated the birth of Jesus. They were not something added into the manuscripts after Jesus' life to make him look good. Okay? They found a complete copy of Isaiah in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Every one of those prophecies and dozens more came true exactly in Jesus. So there's no way that could happen without divine direction. The New Testament prophecies predicted that Jerusalem would be destroyed and not one stone be left on another, and that happened in AD 70, just as Jesus predicted. The Bible predicted that the Jewish people would be scattered to the ends of the earth, but they would be regathered and reestablished as a nation prior to the end of time. And in 1948, Israel became a nation again to the astonishment of the rest of the world. 
And the Bible was again proven true because only God can see the future. And then number seven, we can believe the, in the reliability of the Bible because of its positive effectiveness. Isaiah 55, verse 10, 11 reads, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, don't return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I've sent it. God's word promises to accomplish its purposes. When read with an open mind, it convicts of sin. It convinces people of the deity of Jesus Christ. It leads to salvation by faith in the blood of Christ. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1, 23, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of the imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. After we become Christians, the Bible helps transform our lives because it is milk and meat for the soul, and it helps us mature into the image of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Deuteronomy 32 verse 47 says, They are not just idle words for you. They are your life. <clears throat> and I am amazed at the power of God's word when it's preached. Ancient words, ever true, changing me and changing you. The reading and teaching and preaching of the Bible has transformed people's lives for right out 2,000 years. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Friends, why are you spending precious time and money and effort to participate in your church? It's because the message of this book, yeah, it's 2,000 years old, and yet its words are the source of life for believers. It's alive in us. It's still a lamp under our feet and a light unto our path. The Summer Olympics just began this weekend in Tokyo. Bob Richards, Olympic Champion Paul Walter back in the 1960s once said symbolically that many people were just about 18 inches away from the kingdom of God, the difference between their head and their heart. Jesus said we needed to humble ourselves and become like little children, but it is very, very hard to swallow our intellectual pride and accept by faith what God's revealed to us in his word. But I've taken a few minutes this morning to try to convince you what little children know instinctively when they sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so.